all across the country, whether and, and all across uh, North America. And as we join from our locations, I want to acknowledge the importance of the land and the territories that we all are living on, whether that be unceded or belonging to First Nations, Métis, or other identities. We, we want to celebrate that, recognize the importance of reconciliation and understanding the importance of all peoples on our lands and the history that, that is in there, whether it be conflicted history or history that, that is bound within treaties that we're still learning how to negotiate and recognize it and honor. And so welcome um, and welcome to everyone today. And, and I hope that we are able to have this amazing conversation with our friend, Dr. Max Frieder from Artolution. And Max, every year, this is one of my favorite sessions because I just think that the message that you're sending and the work that you're doing is so important. And, and I can't wait as you walk these students through the, that shift, that shift in conception around, around hope and, and really the images that we continue to see in the news around refugees and, and the, the othering that we, the language that we hear around refugees and, and especially coming out of the States, oh my goodness, I can only imagine the, the last four years that you faced around the messaging on immigration and, and ICE and, and borders and, and all of that and how that, that really influences the subtext of culture. And, and I can't wait to help celebrate this, this sort of reimagining of what, what is refugee? How do we think about refugees? What are we, um, how do we think about the other and our relation and responsibilities to those? And, but also how do we celebrate hope and change and, and new beginnings and, um, and all of that? So Max, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm just so excited to share your message and all the wonderful things that you're, you're doing um, with your organization, Art Evolution. Well, thank you, Sarah, for such an incredible uh, opening statement. Uh, it's just so generous and so full of, um, I'd say, energy. And, and I really appreciate that. And maybe now more than ever, uh, it's important to have these conversations. So I know we have about 40 minutes or so, about an hour. Um, so I'll probably talk for, for you know, about, about two thirds of that. And then would love to have conversations and questions coming from any of, uh, any of our, our, our friends around the world. So um, I'll give a little bit of background. Um, so so my name is Dr. Max Frieder. I am the co-founder and executive director of Art Illusion. And Art Illusion is an international community-based public art education organization. And what that means is we paint murals, we build interactive percussive sculptures out of crash and recycled materials, we do puppetry, performance, dance, all that is led by local artists and educators who we train who are living in refugee camps, conflict zones, and traumatized communities all over the world. So we actually have teams of local artists who are refugees who are living in the camps, who are able to lead their own programs, working with kids, teenagers, families, and they're doing this year round. Um, so, so Sarah, if you're able to maybe show that presentation I had sent over to you, I think we can probably mm -hmm. get that started. And, you know, one of the great things about, um, yeah, 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 thank you so much for, for, for showing that and full screening it. So I put together a little bit of a special presentation that I wanted to share with all of you. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that I wanted to, to start off with is just this energy. So if we look at this kid right here, right, if we look at it, you know, one of the things that I love so much is just that smile in his face right? Covered in paint, you know, completely covered in creative expression. And, you know, one of the things that I love is to think this is not what we always think of as the face of a refugee. Many times we have this image of what a refugee looks like, somebody who might be, you know, have kind of flies in their eyes or these images that might be, you know, very dehumanizing. But what we believe is actually we need to change that paradigm. We need to change that structure to say, actually, refugees are people. Right, they're the kids who just want to get covered in pain and want to have fun and want to feel and want to have emotion and energy. And we need to figure out ways to get these stories into new forms, to get these stories to be told in new and exciting and engaging, and maybe most importantly, emotional ways ways that make us feel from our heart and from our soul that these are real people. So, you can go to the next slide, and 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 what do you see here? That same energy, right? So that first image was in the Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh on the border of Myanmar. And this is in 
the border of South Sudan in the largest refugee camp in Africa called Bidi Bidi. And you look at this little boy. Now, this isn't necessarily the image you might think of when you think of a kid who's had to flee being a, a child soldier, right? Or has had to flee a civil war and ethnic tension. Yet we look at that boy's face and what do we see? We see joy. We see this thirst for creativity and expression. And as we, as we move forward through the presentation, you'll see that whether you're in Bangladesh, whether you're in Uganda, you know, whether you're in uh, you know, Montreal or in Vancouver, that in the end, we need to find ways to create an equitable and equal playing field for us to have conversations, for us to tell stories. Um, you can go to the next slide. I just love this image, which is the final final of the these, these same theme, which what do you see here? This is Noor. She's a paint covered girl uh, from our work in the Syrian refugee camps in Jordan. And when you look at this face, I just I think her face describes everything better than I ever could, which is this idea that no matter what arts and creativity can endure. They inspire resilience. They inspire new ways of seeing the world and they inspire that what I think is people who may be at the worst times in their life, the arts can bring out the best. And I think that concept that no matter how much trauma people have been through, that the arts are always a source of inspiration is something that we need to always think about when we're creating new solutions to many of the problems that we're seeing in the world. You can go to the next slide. So, you know, I, I just wanted to start out by, by, by kind of laying out a, a general framework. So if you look here, you can see these are all the countries we work in all over the world. We've worked in over 30 countries. Um, and each year we work with just around 6,000 kids, between six to 8,000 youth. And, and, and we've done over, uh, actually at this point, over 700 murals, over 700 programs all over the world over the span of 12 years. But what's so interesting that you can all probably imagine is that we would come, we would do these unbelievable projects, me and my co-founder and partner, Joel Bergner, and we'd come, we'd do these projects and, and, we, and we'd paint these giant murals. We met these unbelievably talented, driven, passionate artists. And one of the biggest things that they would ask, number one question was, when are you coming back? And that's the wrong question. The right question is not, when are you coming back? The question is, how can we do this for ourselves? What do we need to have our own tools so that we can work with our own communities, with our own children, and that they can have the opportunity to express themselves? So as you can see, our primary programs uh, are sustainable programs, as in long term, that have lasted over many years, are in the largest refugee camp in history, which is the Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh, in the Syrian refugee camps in Jordan, called Azraq refugee camp, in the in the South Sudanese refugee camps in Uganda, in the displaced Venezuelan communities and internally displaced people of Colombia, as well as throughout the United States, where we are based in, in New York. So you can go to the next slide. So I wanted to kind of lay out a little bit of a general framework so that everybody can understand where I'm coming from before we start looking at some of the really exciting photos that I prepared for us today. So what you, can you see here? You can see a timeline. So this started in 2010. This is really when the word, when the word this weird, bizarre, eccentric, absurd word, artolution, came into being. So, so this weird word, what does it mean, artolution? What is an artolution? And the answer is actually came from my time working in New Zealand with Maori communities, with the indigenous communities there. And, and, and this idea that maybe art can help to create a solution to some of the world's problems. Maybe it can create a resolution to some of the challenges that we face around the world. Maybe it can actually be an evolution in the next phase in the history of the arts. And maybe it'll be a revolution in what's possible to achieve when we come together through creativity. So all these words, revolution, solution, evolution, resolution, Put them all together, and what do you get? Art illusion. So you can see this really shows our timeline of starting just me and my co-founder doing this, this work as nomadic artists. Now we have over 80 artists all over the world who are doing this year round. So we really scaled it, this ideal of scaling from just me doing this as you know an independent person coming from America, to now we have artists all over the world who are doing this for themselves. So you can go to the next slide. Sure, oh, yes. but uh, we just had a quick question. Oh, yes, what, please. You said nomadic artist. What? Yes. So the YouTube was like, what? What, so what that, that means? How do you, what does that sort of identity mean to you? 
Yeah. So initially I actually didn't live in one place for more than about two months, two to three months over the span of about 10 years. So I was literally traveling nonstop for about 10 years, setting up programs. So I was both actually going and painting murals. And we work with partners like UNICEF and UNHCR, uh, the Red Cross, or the International Rescue Committee. And they are the ones who fund these programs and make them possible. Um, you can go to the next slide. And so to answer your question, uh, YouTube colleagues, these are the people who make this possible. And when I say nomadic, I mean, literally, we were traveling nonstop um, to make these projects happen. So this gives you an idea of some of the partners, groups like UNICEF or the International Organization of Migration, UNESCO, who I know you work closely with. We work mm -hmm. with Chime for Change, which is a philanthropic uh, branch of, of the company Gucci. We work with the private sector. Then we also work with the public sector, working groups like the Red Cross, Plan International, as well as working with many UN uh, agencies. You can go to the next slide. So I wanted to put this slide. This is a new slide that I wanted to include. So, um, so you probably uh, uh, heard, and I really appreciated Sarah with the introduction um, that I had about a year ago finished my doctorate, and my doctorate was really focusing on actually five years of data collection, uh, five years of research, and it really focused within those five years of three years of focusing on the Rohingya refugee crisis in Bangladesh, and I had three phases of data collection. Now, one of the things that I was really collecting was to figure out what does it take to have a locally led team that are able to lead their own programs and what does that need to have that locally led model to exist on a long-term basis and these were some of the the spheres of influence that were really identified so you know the importance to have a cultivate a safe learning spaces to have creative spaces that can really be created by the artists and the children themselves how do we create learner-centered approaches and social spheres of relational in influence understanding historical influences where do we lie in the world where do we lie in history? What is our role in history to make? So um, I can share this with you later on if you have any more questions. Mm -hmm. um, you can go to the next slide. I want to share this. This is what we call a theory of change. So this will be helpful for all the students who are out there. A theory of change means how do we know that we're making an impact in the lives of students? How do we know that by participating in a mural, we can actually see a behavioral shift? We can see behavior change. How do we know that? So what we did is we created what was called a theory of change. And this actually walks us through each of the different steps of looking at short-term outcomes, uh, excuse me, short-term outputs, uh, uh, short-term outcomes, mid-term outcomes, and then long-term impacts. So the idea is that even in spite of the barriers that exist, we can see ideas of conflict, depression, mental illness, uh, domestic violence, but that what we can see is that if we can overcome these barriers, here are some of the ways that we can see people can be trained to use the arts to change the entire conversation around refugees. Okay, you can go to the next slide. And I would say if anyone has any questions, please ask. I love questions. I thrive off of questions and I really wanna make sure people are able to participate however they can. So this is one of the last slides that kind of gives the, the, the framework about the ideas behind our work, the, you know, what we might call theory. Theory only matters if there's practice behind it, if there's something that we're actually doing together. So here you can see that all of our programs all over the world are based on the idea that we can make an impact into the lives of children and families in physical, mental, social and emotional different ways. So if you can imagine each of those different components is approaching a holistic idea of how we learn. How do we as people learn? How do we as kids learn? How do we as families learn? And to realize that what we think, what we feel, that being able to breathing workshops are just as important as being able to dance or being able to play or being able to paint. And this idea of how we create safe spaces where this can exist, this is our goal in life. This is our dream. This is what we fight for and work towards every single day of our lives. So you can go to the next slide. Um, and there's a lot more content here you can read about later on. So I wanted to start off in Uganda. So I'm going to be focusing on three regions. I'm going to focus on our work in the South Sudanese crisis, in the Syrian refugee crisis, and in the Rohingya refugee crisis. Just due to time, I decided I was going to focus on those three really specifically. So this is in this is in Bidi Bidi refugee settlement. You can see it's this huge space. And so you can see this is some of the murals that we create. You can go to the next slide. And in this next slide, one of the things you can see is these kids, right? And I love this image. And why do I love this image? What do you see these kids are doing? Can anybody see? They're holding trash. They're holding garbage. 
total discarded rubbish, right? But what are they doing? The, do you see the looks on their faces? You see these smiles, right? You see these bursting, exploding smiles. Now, why are they smiling and holding trash? The answer is, is we do, we have a, a workshop. We have this really goofy, funny name for all the students out there. You'll enjoy it. It's called the Foundstrument Soundstrument Project. And the Foundstrument Soundstrument Project, you can Google that. You can look it up and you can see some great videos. But what we do is we work with kids to collect trash and then to build giant sculptures that all have drumsticks attached to them. Where kids actually collect trash, they learn about sustainability, the environment, recycling and then they actually make music with what they created. So you can see here, this is the trash that these kids collect. And you can imagine we actually made a song together that goes, recycle, recycle, let's recycle, right? Really simple, really easy, but it gets everybody engaged to learn about recycling. Now, what happens next? Uh, you can go to the next uh, slide, Sarah. You can see that we take all this trash and we start to paint it. And these are some of the beautiful kids that we were working with there. And what happens after we paint them? We paint them according to the different sounds of each of the objects. So you can imagine, I had my bowl of cereal this morning. The difference between this sound compared to this. So you can imagine, What's the difference in color between those different sounds? And then the children then paint each of these different objects according to the different colors. You can go to the next slide. And you can see this is what it looks like. It's what we call the elephant instrument. And it's a giant elephant. And when we asked, you know, what, what kind of a sculpture would you want to make? One little girl in the back of the room raised her hand and she said, I want to make an elephant because the elephants actually migrated with us when we fled the war in South Sudan. And they always remember, elephants always remember, and we will always remember our homes. You can go to the next slide. And you can see, what does this look like? Then there's literally hundreds of children who all then are able to use this every single day and are able to make music with it. They're able to play it. They're able to bring this elephant to life, to learn, as well as to talk about the importance of the world and the environment. You can go to the next slide. So the, someone on YouTube is wondering, can you spell the name of this project? Because they want to Gladly. I love it. it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. So you call it Foundstrument. F-O-U-N-D. S-T-R-U-M-E-N-T. Oh, so like found instrument. instrument. Exactly, ah. like a found instrument or a sound instrument. So found instrument, sound instrument. Is, is, is the way you say that one 10 times faster, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, right, so the Found Instrument, Sound Instrument Project, you can see some wonderful films that have been made about it, um, which can really see the kids playing and bringing it to life. We've done it in over 10 countries around the world, so I think you'll really appreciate checking it out. You can go to the next and slide. There was another question. Oh, yes, please. Is, sorry. Is, um, do you do this work in not refugee camps, too? Like, one of the kids wondering, like, how do I get this in my school here in, in of, Canada? Of course. Um, yeah. So first of all, absolutely. We work in all kinds of communities. Um, so we work in, in refugee camps. We also work in what we consider traumatized communities or communities that are facing disparity or maybe some kind of a challenge. Um, so whether it be issues of poverty or gender equality, we work with many different communities. So let's mm -hmm. use an example of America. So we work, uh, we've worked in New York, Chicago, D.C., California, Colorado. So we've worked all across the United States. And by the way, we have worked in Canada as well. Um, I did a big project in Vancouver. Um, and for example, in Vancouver, what was I doing? I was working, doing a rehabilitation program with people addicted to narcotics. So as those might know, there's a lot of issues with addiction in certain areas of Vancouver. And so and so that, that this is one of the programs we've done. We've done work with resettled refugees. We've done work with LGBTQ communities, people who are transgender. We've worked with folks who are uh, special needs, who have autism, or those who might uh, have disparities. So we've worked with one with a private school that was very wealthy and then kids from the public housing projects who mm -hmm. come from a bit more of an impoverished background. So we've had a lot. We've done digital exchange programs during COVID where we've had kids in refugee camps meet kids in schools, let's say in Brooklyn or in California. And so we've been able to create these digital exchange programs, which have just been so inspiring, seeing the kids mm -hmm. meet each other. And, you know, for, imagine if you've never met a, someone who's in a refugee camp before and you get to ask them questions like, what's your favorite food? You know, what do you like to do with your time? And you end up realizing maybe we have more in common than we ever thought. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. You can go to the next slide. 
So I just I, I wanted to use this as a, I think this is a great example of what's possible. This idea of uh, of the importance of the water bearer. Some women have to carry water three or four hours every day to be able to have clean water. And you can see the idea is that this woman one day dreams to become a doctor, and that's what we see in the middle of the image. You can go to the next slide. And, and, and I love this image. And the reason I love this image is because you can see that on the right, there's a boy and a girl. And the, this whole idea was about boys and girls getting equal access to education. So what do we see happening here? We see out of their brains are coming what? But airplanes. And airplanes are turning into birds, which represent their dreams, coming into this big face in the middle. Now, that big face in the middle is actually the first woman to ever graduate in the history of South Sudan from a nursing school. It's the first nurse in the history of South Sudan. And the kids were saying, this is my dream, that one day I can go back from Uganda to South Sudan, can become a nurse that can help heal all the people who got injured in the war. And you can see over here on the left that these are all made out of, these are two giant, giant uh, uh, giraffes that are made also out of trash. When you look up close, they're all made out of garbage. And and, and when we ask why, you know, what do you want to pay? What, what do you, what kind of a sculpture do you want to want to bolt into the wall? One little boy uh, uh, who you can actually see here in the blue shirt, he said, "What what if we do a giraffe?" because giraffes have really long necks and they can see over all the trauma, all the pain, all the war we've been through, but they can see to the future. They can see to the hopes far off in the distance. So you can see we can use poetry, we can use poetics to tell very painful, difficult stories, but we can use the arts to find something inspiring, to find something that can bring hope out of that darkness. You can go to the next slide, please. And so, and, and I just want to quickly show this to you. This is our team. So these, these are the folks who matter the most. It's not about me. It's not about my partner. It's about these folks. It's about Alaba. It's about Esero. It's about, you know, this is, and these are our team who are running programs now year round and they're doing their own work. So if you go to the next slide, you can see these are the murals that they're doing on their own now. So this is their style, their techniques, their way of expressing themselves. This is about mathematics and the importance of, of children studying at home with their families. You can go to the next slide. And you can see this about nutrition and the importance of eating healthy. I can go to the next slide. And you can see this, such an amazing story. So for those who are listening in from around the world, many of you may have access to things like school buses, and that's how you get to school every morning. For, for many children, especially here in Bitty Bitty, that actually, if you'll believe it, that there aren't school buses. So children have to walk sometimes one, two, even three hours to get to school. So there was one, there was one boy when we, were, when we were talking about, well, what are we going to paint? What are the children going to paint? And, 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 and he said, you know, even though we don't have access to school buses, we have to remember that we can always walk. Nobody can ever take away our feet. So we see there's a school bus in the shape of a footprint. And the reason why is the idea that we always have our feet and that one day we will be able to graduate. And then if you look up close in that whole bottom area, these are all paintings that are actually made by the children themselves, which I think is very important for you to know that it's not just the artist making the, the, the work, but the children are actually painting as well. You can, go, you can go to the next slide, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so, so moving on to the era we're all in, we are in the COVID era. We are in this time where nobody knew what are we going to do? Our whole point of making work is being able to work with communities together, but we can't bring communities together in this era. So what can we do? So one of the things we did is we had our artists work with their families, painting murals on canvas at home, and then gluing them up to walls outdoors about public health messaging, the importance of wearing masks, of social distancing, and of being able to take care of ourselves and our families. You can go to the next slide. And I, I just love the next image. I think this is so wonderful, this idea that we can, uh, this is for World Peace Day, of being able to, this idea that we can all come together, put our hands together, and that we are stronger together than separate. You can go to the next slide. And, and this slide, I think, is great if you look at some of the ways that then we actually got invited with UNHCR to paint murals on every single quarantine facility in Uganda. So we painted murals on 15 different quarantine hospitals. This is one of them to raise awareness and to hopefully create something hopeful and positive. You can go to the next slide. 
And you can see these are some of our artisans. You can see all of these different styles and these ways of communicating messages. Now, most important is that it uses local traditions. That is so important because we can't come in from the outside and come up with stories that we want them to tell. They need to come up with their own stories and decide imagery that's going to reflect on their lives and their stories in the most effective way possible. You can go to the next slide. Thank you so much, Sarah. So, so, so we're going to move on to the next location. And what do you see here? You see this really depressing image, right? It's like barbed wire and you can see white sheet metal shacks. And it made a, you know, it's just such a depressing environment. And this is in the, in the Syrian refugee camps and Azraq refugee camp in Jordan. You can go to the next slide. And yet you can see what happens is we can start to bring color to this inc incredibly difficult um, uh, situation where, you know, you're not just dealing with people who are locked in a refugee camp who've been through their own trauma, but now you're dealing with people who are, who are already isolated. And now they're even more isolated because of COVID. People are stuck in their homes. They're not able to go to school. So what, so what's possible? What can we do? Um, and, you know, one thing, I just want to share one very quick story that I think you'll appreciate for, for, for the students out there you see that man right in the center uh with the with the yellow and green on his white shirt his name is muhammad ibrahim he's one of our lead artists and i remember i was sitting i was sitting with him um this was actually on this day that way i took this photo and i said and i was painting with him and he and he looked me dead in the face and he said max what is the most difficult question you've ever been asked in your entire life I looked at him and I said, I don't know, Muhammad Ibrahim, that's a really hard question. And I said, how about for you? He said, when my four-year-old son looked me dead in the face and said, why are people trying to kill us? Mm -hmm. And he said, and he said, you know, I don't know why people are trying to kill us, but we don't hate anybody. And he, and he looked at me and he said, Max, I've seen my four-year-old son not have food and starving. I've seen him thirsty and, and I've not been able to give him water and on the verge of death. And yet somehow every day is better than the last. Mm. I said, what makes you say that, Muhammad Ibrahim? And he said, because we are still alive mm. and nobody can take that away from us. And that every day when I get to wake up and I get to work with the children to paint, to paint our stories, to paint our murals, this is what gives my life meaning. This is the reason why I still feel that I'm alive. And I think that story, when we look to the purpose and the ability for art to transform lives, it's beyond anything that I can even put into words. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and, and, and I really, and I really, I love this. I love this image. And one of the reasons why is, is you see how different a found instrument can look in this environment compared to in Uganda. So you can see this goofy creature that we created together, which I think is just a wonderful example of what's possible. You can go to the next slide. Now, this is what we call the car struments. And we actually took abandoned cars, if you'll believe it, and we actually bolted all of these different, uh, all of this together. And, if you, and, and what was so cool is this then corresponded with a very, very interesting uh, mural. So if you go to the next slide, you can see the mural. All right, there it is. And what do you see about this mural that's so interesting? Um, what I see about this mural that I find interesting is that you see that there's a little girl over on, who's purple and, and her dream in life is to become a engineer, to be a city planner. So you see this woman uh, being a city planner and you can see she's holding a map. Now, her dream was to rebuild Dara. That is a city in Syria. And so you can, you can imagine that her whole life is as a girl to prove that women can become leaders and that women can be part of rebuilding their home in Dara. You can go to the next slide. So one of the one of our students on this YouTube said that they noticed that the colors are different. So on one side it looks like they're really muted, and then on the other side, they're very bright. Exactly. And do you work like with the and, and I think there's a comment here, earlier here in YouTube saying that or in the Zoom room that the, that the colors were very sort of almost hopeful in some ways. Like, do you work exactly. with the the because some of most of this is, is children or people who haven't don't have art education? Like, do you work with them around what are color, what do they mean? How do they make you feel? Like, is that part of your your art training with them? 
It is. It's a major part of our training. And let's be let's be real, everybody. Color makes us feel different ways, right? Yeah. Red might make us feel one way. Blue might make us feel another way. And what we, we always work with is the idea of how do we communicate emotions, right? So one of the things that I think happens a lot of times is people think, oh, I can't paint realistically. I'm not a good artist. And mm -hmm. actually, that has very little to do with being able to express yourself in an honest and an earnest way. And I think that's something that when we see the colors, the bright, hopeful colors, you know, amidst the sea of, of, um, of gray, let's say, those colors are just as important as the content that they are communicating. So it's mm -hmm. both the form and the function, the story and the media, right? It's about being able to have that come together. You can go to the next slide. Thank you so much for that question, Sarah. Uh, and I just want to show you this. So these are some of the women we work with, which I just think are some, you know, beautiful girls that are just able to, 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 to see their faces, I think is so important as well. You can go to the next slide. And, you know, when we're, and you're talking about colors. So this is a great example of colors. So you look at this, and this is what we call complementary colors. Yellow and purple accent each other. And so, and so what you see here is we decided that this was all going to be about hospitality, working with Syrian, Palestinian, and Jordanian girls all together. And what was so interesting about this is you look across it, and it's a girl who's holding a tea kettle to represent hospitality and about people being mm -hmm. welcome. And this idea that we can, that no matter if you're Syrian, Palestinian, Jordanian, we all share the same idea that being able to drink tea together, being able to eat together is something that's close to our heart. You can go to the next slide. Um, and this just shows you our team and some of the murals that they've been doing. So you can go to the next slide, which I think you'll find really interesting. I love this slide. And the reason why is these are the murals that our artists are doing by themselves on their own after they've learned how to do this process. So you can see they're creating these incredibly inspiring images. So, you know, when you say, well, what about kids who've never had any experience painting? For mm -hmm. many children, this is the first time they've ever held a paintbrush in their entire lives. So when you look at this, you look at some of these imagery, you know, over here on the left. And what we do is we incorporate professional artist imagery and mm -hmm. children's imagery and teenager imagery together to create a single story, to create a single hopeful image that's able to communicate a message. You can go to the next slide. And please interrupt me anytime, Sarah, uh, with any questions. I love your questions. Um, and so you can see this is an example, and it's this bleak landscape. You know, you can see what's possible, and this has actually been, been uh, created during COVID, um, which I think is really just a wonderful image to see. You can go to the next slide as well. There's a, there's a comment about COVID in, in the, the chat mm. about how, you know, we're so wrapped up in our own realities. Completely understandable, right? We're all so consumed by this COVID and the pandemic, and and even within Canada, the the uh, that that we're you know there's, we're stuck at home and all that, but but you get sort of wrapped up in your own reality, and and it was just that they hadn't thought about the impact of COVID on refugee camps. And and how have you seen that? I mean, I'm going to turn it into a question, but how have you seen that sort of translate into the art? Because I mean, there's already a lot of trauma and um, but I mean, obviously hope and love and and all of that. But but how have you seen COVID maybe? Um, impact that uh, in a greater degree? Has it amplified sort of those feelings of, of trauma or has it, um, you know, like shifted it? I'm, I'm just really curious what, what you've seen come out through the arc, maybe. Sure. Um, you know, well, well uh, I think if you go to the next slide, it might help okay. with some answering that. But let me, let me give you a little bit of an answer to this. So during COVID, for those people who are already vulnerable, those people who are already isolated, it just made it a hundred times worse. Right. Mm -hmm. So you have to imagine those of us who are isolated in our apartments or our homes around the world in Winnipeg or where I am, I'm in New York. Um, you know, in the end, what we find is that we focus on ourselves. What we don't think about is what about the people who have already lost everything? Right. What about the people who don't who, who don't even have the most basic public health infrastructure, or most basic ability to go to school or, you know, to be able to get an education, et cetera. And what we found is that the arts are an outlet. The arts are an essential outlet for being able to form identity, for people being able to recognize that our life still has value, even if we're not able to go outside, et cetera. And that, and that there are innovative responses that maybe can exist in ways we never thought they could. So I wanted to show you this image. If you look over here on the left, um, you can see this Arabic. And what I love about this image is that this is actually a uh, Facebook internal group 
that was made by refugees in the Azraq refugee camp, not our artists, just local residents who went around taking photos of all the murals that we've done. And then they are the ones who are proud of the work that's happening in their own refugee camp. That's really important when we think about identity, when we think about ownership, when we think about feeling connected to others. And then over here, we look at Samir, who's, who's one of our lead artists, and he made this just amazing suit out of trash, right? And he'll mm -hmm. perform and it's musical. And, and this, this was literally came out of COVID. Because you can imagine he's alone in his home with his family. So he's trying to figure out ways of activating um, the community. So he decided to do this. So this is a way that he came up with a solution to the problems that he was seeing, which is issues of depression, issues of mental illness. So we needed to find a ways of mental health, of being able to make people happy, of being able to have joy, celebration. And I think maybe now during COVID is the most important time to have this. So if we go to the next slide, I realize we have about 15 minutes before we finish the session. So I want to make sure to add to have time for any finishing questions people may have. This gives you an idea of this suit that he has, um, the Samir suit. So you can go to the next slide. And, 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 and I'm going to finish. Um, uh, 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 oh, I just see that there's a, a question here. Um, is there a similar image you include in all of your murals? Such a great question um, from St. Albert uh, Belarus. So, um, you know, what we found is that the imagery has to come from the communities themselves. So they are the ones who decide we want to paint a deer, for example, as you see in this image, because that represents peace in Syria. So what we find is that there's a lot of imagery that has specific cultural motifs. So, for example, we see that there's a lot of portraiture that might exist because they want to represent their mother, right? Or we might see a specific animal because it represents a cultural fable or a tradition. And so we find that there is some repeating imagery, but it's very specific to each cultural context. And, and I think my, the next slide will help answer that question. Go to the next slide. So, so this, we're going to end with this, uh, this last location, which is the Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh. This is the largest refugee camp to have ever existed in history. You have to imagine that, that, that up until recently, the largest refugee camp was huge. It was 450,000 people called the Dab refugee camp in Kenya on the border of Somalia. Yet, uh, with the recent influx in 2017, the, the most recent refugee camp is, if you can guess, it's actually 1.2 million people. So it's over double the size of what was previously the largest refugee camp to ever exist. And this is what it looks like. It's an unending sprawl of bamboo shacks. You can go to the next slide. And yet, when you're looking at it, look at what happens when you start to bring some color into this environment. Look at what happens when you start to see what's possible as far as being able to transform these spaces into something that's able to bring meaning into what can sometimes feel like a meaningless situation. You can go to the next slide. And this is what it's about, right? It's about these kids. And I just, I love this image. These are the kids who are painting with us. I love this image because you can see all the different facial expressions. And rather than having this image of these really depressed looking kids, this mm -hmm. is what kids should look like, right? Like full of joy and like happiness and, and, and feeling like, yo, I can relate to those kids. I can relate to them because they remind me of my brother or sister. Now, if you go to the next slide, you'll see why I say that. So in this slide, one of the things that we would do is, you know, you were asking about stories. This was asked previously, what are similar images? So this is one, for example, we see an elephant. And that elephant represents the Rohingya families who had to flee and cross the Naf River carrying their homes on their backs. And they, and they decided to choose the rooster, which represents the Bangladeshi people welcoming them in with open arms. Okay. Now, now, what's so interesting, you think about that story, we then decided we wanted to act that out kind of like a play. So we created these puppets, we created these costumes. And if you go to the next slide, uh, Sarah, what you can see is that, is that uh, uh, one before, thank you. And what you see in this slide is, look at these kids, like, 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 look at these facial expressions. And what we did is we had this amazing moment, and I just want to share a quick story with you that I think really will answer that question, is, is if you can imagine that we brought all these off, off cuts of fabric that were literally just pieces of trash, just garbage, just literally a fabric. Um, uh, uh, and so, so one of the things that we do, and then I'll answer the, the, the next question is, um, is, is we brought piles of off cuts of fabric and what happens is the kids start to take the fabric and they start to throw it up in the air and they start to sing and they start to dance and it becomes this huge celebration. And in the community center, 
there, there, there comes a group of about 12 very serious looking men. They were imams, so they were religious Muslim leaders. They had the very long beards and they looked really strict. And I was a little nervous thinking, what are they going to do? Am I going to get yelled at? Are we in trouble? And all of a sudden, these men come into the space and they pick up some of the pieces of fabric and they start throwing it up in the air and <laughs> they start singing and they start dancing and it bursts out of the community center and then there were all these women who were in the full burqas you can imagine and they start tying these pieces of fabric around their head and they start singing and dancing and all of a sudden you could tell that these people were so thirsty they were so hungry for a reason to celebrate, for a reason to have joy in their lives, that, that we see that the arts become that catalyst. The arts become the way to make that happen. And if we look at this image, then this is actually the image of a Rohingya doctor. And right now, Rohingya people are not allowed to become doctors in Bangladesh. So the idea is that one day they could become a doctor. I do want to answer this question that I just saw. It must be hard to leave these communities when you when a project is done. How do you stay positive? I love that question. And the answer, number one, is it is hard to leave these communities. But, but the reality is, is that at its core, it's about our local artists. It's about them continuing to lead and about them being able to bring hope. And I stay, we have WhatsApp groups, so we're in daily contact with our artists um and so you have to you have to kind of imagine these relationships never disappear the relationships are always there and that matters so much to, to being able to stay positive you can go we to the have next also, slide also uh, a question oh, yeah. from youtube from brayden and he's wondering how and it relates to that is that how do you find these artists in the local communities because i mean everyone's sort of disjoint from their home communities it's not like you can google them right or maybe right. You can. no 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 exactly <laughs> So, so, I, so I would say there's kind of, it's, it's, it's what I would call a continuum. So there's a range of different ways that we deal with this. The, at its best, right, at, at, at the best of situations is like uh, what, what happened in Uganda. In Uganda, we literally work with our very close partner, the UN Refugee Agency, UNHCR, and we said, we need to find artists and educators. said, no problem, we're going to go to every school in the refugee camp. We're going to ask every single teacher who is an artist, do they know any artists? And the day you arrive, we will have a team. And lo and behold, I arrived and did the series of interviews and we had this incredible team ready the day I arrived. It was amazing. Okay. But the opposite is what happened in Bangladesh, which is I was asking and people said there are no artists here. I said, that's impossible. There are artists in every community in the whole world. Now that's not yeah. to say there aren't artistic cultural traditions in, in the Rohingya culture, which there are, but many people don't call themselves artists. They may call themselves a craftsman or they may call themselves a seamstress. So I literally had to go for two, almost three weeks knocking on every <laughs> single door asking person to person, have you seen any artists? Now, if you go to the next slide, this, is, this will be a, a, a good, good explanation, is we ended up finding these, some incredible artists. And I wanted to share the story of Dildar, of this woman who's, who, who's here, which may answer that question. How do we find them? And once we find them, what happens? So, um, which by the way, for those who are really dedicated, I know uh, I don't expect that many people on this call to be this dedicated, but if you're really interested in that question, please um, uh, read my dissertation, or at least um, you might be interested in that. If you're interested in reading, I know it's very long. I don't expect anybody <laughs> to really read it. It's over 453 pages. Um, so, so I don't expect anyone to read it, but if you're interested and you really want to know more about this, I'm going to put a link to it right now in the chat. Um, and then everybody can have access to it um, if you want to use it. So what I wanted to do really quickly, I'm doing it as we speak. Um, what I wanted to do is to answer that question. I actually want to be really honest with you. And I want to, and I want to tell everybody here that the reality is, is I actually don't really have the right to answer that question because I am not one of those refugee artists, right? I am, I'm the trainer. So in order to answer your question, why don't we bring a, one of our refugee artists into the room today with us? One of the people who may not get to be a part of this conversation, one of the people who may not have access to internet or be part of the Zoom call. Mm. And so what we're going to do is, is I'm going to read a testimonial. And it's going to be a testimonial that comes from the voice of Dildar. This is Dildar. She's one of the most inspiring women I've ever met in my entire life. And she actually... Uh, had what we call shock-based mutism. This comes from somebody who's experienced such serious trauma that she actually wasn't able to speak for nine months 
after she had her father killed and she had unfortunately witnessed one of her best friends getting raped and then killed and just horrific trauma. And, and so, and so I really want to make sure when we're answering that question, that, 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 that we're getting the answers from the people we're talking about. So rather than talking about them, we're going to talk to them. So mm -hmm. um, I'm going to read this excerpt and I hope it answers your question. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Here, here's the excerpt and I'll, and it should only take about 30 seconds. Uh, thank you so much. Okay. So, um, it is right here. So, uh, this is from 2018. Okay. Here it is. Okay. When we were in Myanmar, we were in jail. We were detained. We were in a physical jail. We just lived as detained people and we lost our family members and our husbands and fathers were all killed. There's a horrible situation inside of Myanmar. When I arrived in Bangladesh, I couldn't even speak and I was traumatized. And I wasn't able to speak to people because I didn't even feel anything that I was even alive. People would ask me many questions and share many things, and I was just quiet. I feel that, that there's the same situation across the camp. When I work and engage with Artolution, I started to speak for the first time. I feel I get my life back, and I was reborn. And I try to speak, and I continue to speak. And this is not only me. There are around the camp thousands of women like me. When I visit the camp and work with different people across the different camps, I help them to speak. And thousands of people are, are like them. I want so that I can help all of the people. Those who do not have a voice, they can raise their voice and they can say whatever they want. That is what I want to keep continuing every single day. Dildar, 2018. Uh, Balukali, Bangladesh. Um, and I wanted to share that story from her voice because I think that really answers what, what does it take, which is that somebody who, who's been through such trauma like Bildar here, and yet her motivation is I need to inspire others, right? Like I've been through this horrific trauma, but my responsibility is to help others to come out of their shells and to feel inspired and to feel like they can do something meaningful in the world. I can go to the next slide, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so just because I realize we only have about five, six more minutes um, uh, until the end of our presentation, I may ask you to go a little more quickly, Sarah, through the slides. But this gives you an idea about the water pump um, and the importance of washing our hands. You can go to the next slide. Um, and you can see here, this, this, for example, is all about the importance of a Rohingya and a Bengali child being able to have the same dreams, right? Which is that idea of a single light bulb they share in, in one mind. And this came from one little boy named Shumo who raised his hand after we got a permit to bring Rohingya children out of the refugee camp for the first time in history. And, um, and, and he said, and he, and he raised his hand in the back of the room and he said, I'm a Buddhist boy and I know that there have been many people killed uh, in Myanmar and I take accountability for this. I, as an eight-year-old boy, take accountability that we need to treat these people like they are our family members and they need an education. They deserve the right to food. And I started to look around and I started to see that all of our artists were crying. And, and, I, was, and I asked, why are you crying? And they said, this little boy just, just told us that we are human. Nobody has told us to us th this to us, and it came out of the mouth of an eight-year-old boy. Mm -hmm. And you can see that the arts are that, the way that this is able to happen, the way it's able to come to life. Mm -hmm. I can go to the next slide, Sarah. And I think these stories really matter. Um, you can see the importance of being able to go to the doctor and being able to be educated about the importance of knowing that if you're sick, you go to the doctor. So being able to use this for low literacy populations, people who may not be able to read and write, and using imagery to teach messages. I can go to the next slide. And, and, and we even got to the point of actually painting a giant school bus, which now takes kids uh, to and from school every day in Bangladesh. So I, th I think this is just a wonderful mm -hmm. image to see what the school looks, looks like, this crazy, colorful school bus, which now lives every single day. I can go to the next slide. Uh, and you can see what it looks like from up above. We even painted the entire ceiling, the entire roof of it mm -hmm. with, with Bengali and Rohingya children. I can go to the next slide. Uh, and, and what I want to focus on now to finish is the, is the murals that our artists are doing for themselves. So these are some of the images that our artists are creating. You have to imagine none of them actually been to school. They have not had access to, to actually get educated. And so you can see this is all paying homage to women and being able to respect women. Go to the next slide. 
Um, even painting latrines, uh, toilets, right? And being able to teach about uh, the importance of washing our hands, healthy practices of going to the bathroom, uh, which is really important for life-saving messages. I can go to the next slide. Uh, more, more images, if you can see the style that they're learning, that they're cultivating, that they're bringing to life. And that's what matters the most. I can go to the next slide. Okay, and, um, and you can see, you know, right along the main side road where thousands of people see these murals every single day. Uh, next slide. And, uh, and, 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 this is, and, so, and this gives you an idea, this is our team, right? You can see half men, half women all across the world, all of our work are half men and half women, which I think matters a lot. Uh, you can go to the There's next actually slide. a question about that please, in please. chat. Please. So as one of the students um, from our, our, here, I'm just bringing it up now, Alberta School was saying that she, her family herself came from a refugee camp in Lebanon, and she doesn't know if her father or uncles would have let her participate in this sort of project. And she's wondering if you see that sort of, like, do more boys tend to participate than girls? Or is, like, is, how does gender impact um, participation in your program in terms of, I mean, you're, you told the story of a female artist, but how do you, how do you see gender play into this in other ways? In every way you could imagine. Gender is maybe the biggest deal you could imagine. So for us, we actually require that all of our programs are half men, half women, and half boys and half girls. Uh, for, uh, I will tell you, we've worked in Lebanon and we've worked in refugee camps in Lebanon as well. Um, and working with Palestinian refugees and with Syrian refugees. Mm -hmm. And you know, and, and you're right, there's a lot of very conservative communities where we have to really convince the local imams, uh, convince the local parents that, that this is something positive. Now, a couple mm -hmm. of things. Number one, that we have local artists who are convincing the families really matters. So not that me, the Western, you know, Max comes in and describes it, but that rather we have actually, you know, Samir or Wafa or Muhammad Ibrahim or Dildar, they're the ones who are convincing the families. I can go to the next slide. And, and, and that I think matters a lot. Right. And I think it matters a lot because it gets that local community buy in, which is just such a priority. It matters so much in so many ways. Um, and, and you can see, especially in a camp this large, and you can see the two little tiny elephants down there on the wall. Um, you can see some, like you said, yeah, and, and we're just on the last couple of slides before we were about to finish. So if you go to the next slide, I just wanted to let everybody know, um, and you can go to the next one as well. That's a zoom in. Um, is that is uh, yeah you can just keep flipping. Um, is that recently there was a, a, a mad this is actually the largest mural in the history of the Rohingya culture at 120 meters and this is the first art center ever created in the Rohingya culture as well, um, which you can see is our art center right there, uh, which is donated to us. Um, but the last thing I wanted to share is that recently, for those who know or may not know, like next slide, uh, there was a massive fire that just happened in the Rohingya refugee camps. Over 10,000 homes were burnt, over 50,000 people have been displaced, and so we're, and, and many of our artists had their homes all burned and destroyed. You can go to the next slide. So right now, what we're trying to do um, is we are making murals like this about COVID, but also about trauma relief. You can go to the next slide. And that in these, and that in this imagery, you can see that it's really taking on this personification it's really bringing it to life um and you can go to the next slide um uh, which i think you'll appreciate and here you know you can see all these different images and yet what happens when there's a, a major crisis within a crisis a fire within a refugee crisis and this is the fire what happens and the answer is is that we've now on emergency response working with children many of which who've had physical burns who've been through really serious trauma and yet unbelievably look at this Four of the art centers we work in all got burned to the ground, and yet somehow the murals survived the fire. They survived the ashes. And so you can see our, our artists are, sta are standing here now right at the forefront of the response, and we're fundraising kind of for the badly needed um, response to be able to build back their homes that have all been destroyed. I can go to the, 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 the next image. Um, and so, so if we go to the final image, which is the next image, this is what it's all about. It's about our team. Right? It's about our artists. It's about these faces. It's about, you know, Kizito and Ayla and Dildar and, you know, the, it's about them. So when we start to think about what is the next phase in the history of the arts and the next phase in the history of education, I truly believe the arts need to be at the forefront of being able to respond to crises all over the world. Um, I just attached in the New York Times article. Uh, they they, they <laughs> produced a, a feature article that was really wonderful. So for any students who want to learn more, please read the article 
article. You can send us more information about uh, any questions you have at info at artolution.org. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, all of the handles we have. Just look up Artolution mm -hmm. and you'll find it. And um, it has been a complete honor to talk to you. I love talking to you every time, Sarah. Yeah. I love the work you guys do. I think you are so inspiring. And I hope one day to be able to meet some of the students who, mm -hmm. who, who heard this. So if anyone has any more questions, please be in contact. And, um, you know, even if we're fighting for just a droplet of healing in a sea of pain, it just takes one droplet to be able to make ripples that can change the world. Okay. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you, Max. I mean, this is one of my most look, I, I look forward to this event, one of the most this year, because um, it really feels like we're vibing on the same lines. You know, this idea that, that we we must learn alongside each other. The idea, like the Talanoa that the UN is using, that, that empathy comes through understanding people's stories and sharing those stories and investing in them and, and really, you know, trying to learn um, with other people, not about them, but with, alongside, in, in coordination with, in collaboration with. And, and I really feel that coming from your organization and the work that, that all of your artists and are doing in the communities. And I mean, there's a few questions here that we, that I would have loved to, the one about if you've ever gotten in trouble about an image or, or is there stuff you're being told not to draw or not to talk sure. about? And I mean, I'm sure you could do a whole presentation <laughs> just on controversy. <laughs> I mean, I could give like a quick one sentence answer to that oh, okay. um, um the answer the, 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 no no the answer is yes um we've had many different times where we've had to really navigate the situation so for example if we're painting a mural across from a mosque we always ask the imam the the, the religious leader what is and is not acceptable mm -hmm. we always talk to the local community what you know what is and is not acceptable um luckily we haven't really gotten into much trouble because we we work with the local community so if you just come in as an outsider and you do something and you leave you very oh. well can get into trouble yeah. but if you come in and you have the local artists working with the local imams, the local children, the local families, the local tribal leaders, all coming together saying, let's figure this out. Let's create something inspiring. We've had, um, that's really the way that we've avoided some of those controversies and problems. It's all about, you know, really taking, being mindful about that colonial framework, about stepping outside and saying, what, uh, uh, sure, we all have these ideas that Oh, I'll just fly to Peru and I'll build them a school and, and or I'll build them a playground and, and I'll fix, I know how to fix you, but, but what does the community want? What does the community, right. what, do they need? What, are the, what are their messages and their needs and their desires that we can't identify problems for people. They have to bring those messages forward to us. And I'm just, so thank you so much for, um, I think I one, I'm going to do one last question. Do it, and do it, it, do it. I love how engaged everybody from, is. From YouTube is what is the one thing they can do today to help? Is it join your Instagram group and and raise the spread the message? Is it help to fundraise? Like, what's one thing they can do to help you do do the work that you guys are doing? So to be honest, it's not going to be that exciting an answer, um, you know. Uh, but the, but the, but the reality is 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 we are in dire need of funding. Um, we, we've had to lay off staff. Um, we've you know, COVID has been a really tough time for us. And for a lot of students out there, even if you're a high school student or a middle school student, one thing that you can do that we found to be really successful is start your own fundraiser. You know, you can create a fundraiser on Facebook that's really easy to do for our dilution, and you, and you don't even have to necessarily donate your own money. You can get your friends to each donate a dollar or five dollars. You know. Um, and so that would be one thing I'd say is, is being able to create your own fundraisers. We, we created one for this fire response. So if you're able to share it to your networks, that would be amazing. And please follow us on all of our social media pages. But I'd say if you, if you could do your own fundraisers, that would mean the world to us. If your parents might want to donate, even a $10 donation means the world to us, mm -hmm. um, you know, and to our artists, you have to imagine we're actually paying them full time. So they're, you know, that's how they're able to put food on their table, um, is by being an artist, which is this amazing, you know, transformation. They maybe never thought they'd be an artist and so i'm going to end with one final uh, 30 second story maybe 20 second story um before we get off um i was talking to muhammad noor um who's, who's one of our lead artists in the rohingya camps and he told me he said you know when i was in myanmar i told my mother my dream in life is to become an artist that was my whole dream and she said muhammad noor you will never become an artist because artists get killed in Myanmar by the government, and we don't want you to get killed, so you will never become an artist. So this guy literally took pieces of charcoal, okay, that were from a burnt fire, and he would hide in his home, and he would make drawings and trash. 
Okay, and he would hide them, and nobody could see them. And then he ended up having his home burned, and he and he had to flee, and had some of his family members killed, and he ended up actually digging holes in the ground and having to bury himself with dirt during the day, and then during the night he would run. Ended up building a raft to float across the Naf River, and he got to the refugee camp and didn't really have enough food to be to to live. So he was going from place to place, and he heard about some crazy American who was coming looking for artists, and he found. And he found me and said, well, I'm not really sure if I'm an artist, but I love making art. It was always my, excuse me, always my dream my whole life. And, and, and what was so amazing is he said, my mother came up to me after months of working with him. And she said, mashallah, by the will of God, we had to lose everything that we had. But now you get to live your dream. And now mm-hmm. you get to represent our culture to the world. Mm-hmm. And you think about that. And there's no greater gift to give than being able to achieve our dreams, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you were saying, what can you do? We want to be part of your dream. We want to be able to help you achieve your dreams. And I say that to the audience who's listening today. Um, And so, so, you know, whether that means you being able to either, you know, fundraise or connect with some of our artists around the world or being able to help form partnerships, you know, right now we're just looking to kind of stay afloat and make a bigger impact as much as we possibly can every single day. Uh, needed now more than ever before. So it's just, again, it's always such a highlight to, to, to do these talks with you, Sarah. It, uh-huh. it, it just gets me really energized and inspired. So thank you so much. Well, same, same to you, Max. So I wanted to say goodbye to our friends who have joined us today and to Max, of course, for, for your enthusiasm and your amazing message. But goodbye to Newfoundland and thank you to our friends here in Alberta, um, in St. Albert and in Edmonton. Um, we had our, our friends joining from Winnipeg on YouTube and Brazil. And I just want to say, Hello, and thank you to everyone who, who's joined us today, and we hope to see you again soon. Bye. Thank you so much. Merci. Obrigado. Shukran. Bye, everyone. Bye.